Hey everybody, Josh Morgan here, also known as Hurricane Man, also known as The Chaser Dude. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, good morning, wherever you are around the globe, and Happy New Year. I know it might sound a little stale to be saying that, but this is the first uh, broadcast of iCyclone Live in 2022, so I thought I should say that. And I want to give a couple of special shout outs today to some of the iCyclone Live faithful. Uh, first off, I want to give a shout out to Lois in the United Kingdom. Uh, she stays up to the crazy early morning hours uh, every for every broadcast of this show. It's just this show broadcasts at a terrible time for folks in England and in Europe. So uh, Lois, thank you very much. Want to say thanks also to Pam in South Carolina. I'm always enjoying your industrial grade positivity. Uh, I want to say hey to Greg in Louisiana. I hope that things are improving in Homa. Uh, I saw the the devastation that Ida caused to your community, and I think about you guys every day. I want to also say hello to Rob at the other side of Louisiana in Lake Charles. I hope your shoot in Cameron went well today, and I want to give a very special shout out to my really good buddy, David in Gulfport, Mississippi. Uh, David was really kind to me. Uh, after Hurricane Zeta smashed the Mississippi coast a couple of years ago, uh, David, he hardly knew me and he offered me a generator. We didn't have power. And uh, I so appreciated that. We became uh, really good buddies since. And uh, David, I'm looking forward to coming back to coastal Mississippi and seeing you and Hunter real soon. I want to also give a shout out to Aaron in Seattle. And finally, to Eric, uh, south of the border in Guadalajara, Mexico. Eric has been my longtime chase partner uh, for Mexican chases. He comes with me on some of them. And uh, Eric and I have been on some incredible life or death uh, sort of adventures together. We've been to hell and back. And uh, Eric, I'm looking forward to uh, chasing down some new storms with you south of the border once the summer gets going. So thanks to everybody. All right, so here we are. We are deep in the off hurricane season, the hurricane off season. Well, for you guys, not for me. Really, it shouldn't be off season for me. Um, I should be prowling all corners of the globe for a hurricane or a cyclone or whatever you call it, wherever it is. Uh, of course, the problem is COVID. It continues to make my world a little smaller than it should be. Uh, I'm still hunting for angles on ways to get down to the south southern hemisphere to, to hunt down a storm during our winter, and I'll have some more information about that in a little while. Uh, meantime, I'm enjoying being back in LA and in so, sort of reconnecting with my life in Southern California. That there is uh, behind me is a picture I took on the beach, either in Marina del Rey or Venice. Those are neighborhoods in LA. And yeah, it's nice being back. I'm especially enjoying the healthy eating. It's very easy to eat healthy in LA. Uh, not to knock, Mississippi cuisine is amazing and it's very delicious, but um, it's not exactly the most health conscious as I think uh, everyone would agree. But uh, I am looking forward to returning to Mississippi in June. I'm actually very excited about it. I've kind of, I, mean, I like the way my life is right now where I spent half the year in coastal Mississippi and half of it in Southern California. It's a really nice balance and I'm really into it. And folks ask me, they say, you know, just honestly, which do you like better, California or Mississippi? And honestly, and I really mean this, this is not a cop out and this is not me being diplomatic, but I really, I love them both, you know, in different ways. You know, uh, California and Mississippi could not be more dissimilar. I mean, the landscape, the people, the architecture, the way folks talk, the way they think, the way they're wired. I mean, these are two really different places. And for me, I mean, that's that's what makes it fun, how different they are. That's what makes the US fun, in my opinion. You know, we've got 50 states that are like 50 different universes under one flag, and that's awesome. You know, and I noticed lately the country feels a little kind of divided, you know what I mean? And uh, my big hope for 2022 is that we could appreciate the differences. You know, we could appreciate that Mississippi is not like California and that California is not like Mississippi and all kind of enjoy that because that makes it fun, you know, and maybe stop the judgment that's going both ways. That's my hope for 2022. All right, that's my sermon for today. Let's get on to hurricanes. That's what you came here for. I got some cool segments to share. I'm going to talk about my plans for how I'm going to hunt down a cyclone in the Southern Hemisphere, despite all the travel restrictions. I'm also going to talk about a big typhoon that just smashed the Philippines. That's a very big story that just happened. This is fresh news. And then also some of the usual segments, uh, Forgotten Chases, where I talk about one of my sexy, sexy but lesser known uh, past chases. And my favorite segment, Get Over It, where I get to abrasively uh, share an unpopular opinion without apology. All right. And then I'll open it up for chatting. And you could see right there, you could post your comments and questions and all that. And I will get to as many as I can. Since I MC this show alone, it makes it a little hard. I keep thinking to bring someone in so that they can kind of maybe field the questions and, you know, get the good ones to me. Maybe I'll do that at some point. 
There are no special guests this episode. As I mentioned when I started the show, I was not looking to be a uh, weather nerd Oprah. You know, this is not a talk show. Uh, occasionally, I will have people on when I'm feeling inspired by someone and I want to bring their inspirational energy into the show. Uh, but this for this show, I felt like this episode, I felt like kind of flying solo. So that's what I'm going to do. Now, this episode is going to be about an hour, maybe a little longer, which is quite a bit shorter than recent episodes. I was looking back at two and three and man, those episodes, they were over two hours. They were crazy long. So maybe, I don't know, maybe too long. So we're going to try a leaner, meaner format this time around. And uh, finally, before we dive in, I want to give thanks to Kestrel Instruments. This show is brought to you in partnership with Kestrel Instruments. Now, as you guys know, Kestrel provides the equipment that I take into storms to do all the cool measuring that I do. And I'm a brand ambassador for Kestrel, and I love talking about these products because I so believe in them. And I'm going to be sharing a little more about them in this episode because I get asked a lot of questions about Kestrel. All right, let's dive in. First, I want to talk about upcoming live events. Yes, live in-person events, not Zoom events, events where people, human beings are interacting. I miss that stuff. All right, and the next one's very soon. It is the National Storm Chaser Summit, okay? And this is in the Oklahoma City area, and it's actually a week from tomorrow. It's next Friday and Saturday, the 21st and 22nd uh, in Midwest City, Oklahoma. And this is an awesome lineup, this show. You got a lot of heavy hitters. You got uh, Tim Marshall, you know, he's the, he's the dude who's a, he's an engineer and a meteorologist, and he like surveys tornado damage on the ground to help the National Weather Service uh, figure out how strong they were. Dr. Reed Timmer, my good friend, is gonna be there. He's always awesome. I'm going to be there. It's a great lineup. And uh, I'm actually particularly excited about the talk that I'm giving. I'm going to talk about Hurricane Dorian, which I experienced from ground zero and how I measured it and how I survived it. And I call it the storm of the century because it was. Uh, Dorian, when it hit the Bahamas, was the strongest hurricane on record to strike North America, tied with the 1935 Labor Day hurricane. This thing was incredible. And it's uh, I'm glad I survived it. I'm glad I was able to collect some incredible data inside of it. And that's the tale I'm going to be telling. This was a big presentation that I was going to actually give across the South and the Midwest in the spring of 2020. But all those events were canceled, of course, because of the pandemic. So I never really got to give this show live. And I'm going to be doing it at the National Storm Chaser Summit. So again, there's the information. You register at chasersummit.com and it's only 80 bucks, which if you do the conference circuit, you know that is crazy cheap. And it's just the thing I love about the in-person conferences is just meeting people afterward. You know, folks who uh, who I interact with on social media, just meeting them in person is like a really, that's a cool thing. And I really enjoy that. And I hope you can come. And listen, even if you weren't planning it, let's say you live in uh, Oklahoma or Texas or Arkansas or Kansas, like around that area. Hey, you know, it's a, it's a half a day road trip. And then you could, uh, you know, just enjoy the conference. Most of it happens on the Saturday. So I hope to see you there. And then I want to tell you about one other important event coming up this spring. This is the National uh, tropical Weather Conference. This is my favorite of all hurricane conferences. This is the one that I never miss. It's in South Padre Island, Texas. Last two years, it was up. Uh it was virtual. It's live again. And it's going to be at this cool resort on South Padre Island in Texas. It's a lot of fun. It's a high caliber event. Usually a couple of uh, present and former directors of the National Hurricane Center are there. And you'll have some specialists from the National Hurricane Center, some real high profile national media uh, folks, and then chaser dudes like me. It's just, it's a great it's my favorite conference, and I hope that you go there. It's in uh, April on South Padre Island, Texas, and you can see there to register Hurricane Center Live. Hope to see you there. If you have questions, ask me about it. All right. So with that, let's jump into the search. So what search are you talking? I'm talking about my search. My search for penetration number 61. And penetration, that's what I call when I get into the inner core of a hurricane or a typhoon, the part that really matters. I call that a penetration. Now, some folks think that's very suggestive language, but actually I didn't make it up. It's not, uh, that language is not my uh, invention. That's actually what the hurricane hunters, the recon folks, that's what they call it when they go into a hurricane uh, core, they call it a penetration. And that's what I call it. I've had 60 uh, throughout my life and I'm now looking for 61. Now, a lot of you probably, I know you think that in the off season, this is like, this is me, uh, just kind of like, sort of like hibernation mode, you know, I'm just kind of like, you know, and, and there's some accuracy, there's some truth to that because unlike a lot of storm chasers, 
I am not versatile. I don't chase snow, yuck. Uh, and I don't chase those little twisty things. And what do they call tornadoes? I don't do any of that. I'm a hurricane guy. So it does mean that, you know, January things kind of slow down for me. And definitely I am a little bit of a sleepy bear part of the time. But while I'm doing that resting and relaxation and recharging, I am keeping an eye south of the equator for events like this one. This is Cyclone Debbie striking Queensland, Australia back in 2017. I chased this storm. It was a crazy, crazy chase. One of my most harrowing ever. I ended up in a little farmhouse in the middle of some flooded cane fields and I was stuck there for three days. An incredible uh, experience and I want to get back there to chase some more. Unfortunately, this stupid thing keeps getting in the way. This darn virus really uh, interferes with our plans. Now, I know uh, different people have different perspectives on this. I know if you probably live in a small town in the south or the Midwest, you're like, what are you talking about? Life is normal. And I know what you mean, because when, when I'm in Bay St. Louis, I notice for some reason in a smaller town, you're less aware of the, uh, of the whole pandemic thing. You know, just life seems kind of normal. But you go to big cities in the U.S. or anywhere else in the world, and this is very much a part of life, how folks are coexisting with this. And if you travel internationally, if you're a globetrotter like I am, this has been life-changing. You can't even enter half the country countries that you used to go to. You can't go to Japan, can't go to Taiwan, can't go to the Philippines, can't go to any of those countries. And even ones where you can get in, you have like, you know, 14 day quarantines and stuff like that. So this has really affected how I chase and where I can chase. And it means I have to search far and wide for chase turf outside of North America, outside of the US and Mexico, where it's a little easier. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at the chase theater. So this is a world map. The yellow line is, of course, the equator. And uh, you can see these white lines along the coast. These are places that are generally places that get strong cyclones, places that could be interesting to chase. And that star up there, that is LA. That's where I am. So I'm keeping an eye on this whole region. And I'm thinking, okay, where can I chase right now? Well, it depends. So the top the top Southern Hemisphere destination is always going to be Australia because it's a developed country. There's good infrastructure and they get a lot of cyclones. Australia is basically off limits right now. Um, even if you're vaccinated and boosted as I am and you follow all the rules, you still have a long quarantine to get in. Uh, Australia has some of the strictest uh, uh, travel uh policies or entry requirements of any country anywhere. So Australia is going to be off limits again this year, it's looking like. And then that comes to the next place is New Caledonia. This is actually a territory of France. It's uh, You can enter, there are some restrictions, but it's possible and they do get cyclones. So New Caledonia is an area I'm thinking of, I'm keeping an eye on. And then there's this uh, island nation called Vanuatu. Uh, Vanuatu has never been an appealing option for me chase-wise. It's a beautiful country, but from a chaser perspective, uh, the nation is a lot of widely spaced islands that are very hard to hop around. So it's really, it's tough island roulette. There's not a lot of infrastructure. Vanuatu is like a big gamble. It's not, it's not a place I plan to chase. Then there's Fiji. Now, Fiji, as you can see, it's another island nation, but notice, and we're going to zoom in on it in a second, but there's a couple of big chunky islands there. So it's a, for a variety of reasons, Fiji is in play. I'm going to talk about this more in a minute. Then you get to that island nation. That's called Tonga. Tonga, like Vanuatu, is they get strong cyclones. They got a really big one a couple of years ago, but another place that's really hard to chase because it's a bunch of very tiny, widely spaced islands. And then you have Samoa and American Samoa, which are, again, kind of tough. And then you go in the Indian Ocean, you have Mozambique uh, accessibility issues per uh, sort of make it tough to go there or Madagascar. I would like to chase in Madagascar. I've fantasized about it for years. Every time I look at flights there, it's like four connections and it takes 30 hours. It's like, oh, you know, that's uh, Madagascar is something I might try in the future if I do a season where I'm stationed for the whole season, let's say down there. And then finally in the Southern Hemisphere, you got the, what are called the Mascarene Islands. And you have this big island, which is called Réunion. That's a, that's a territory of actually, it's a part of France, even though it's all the way down there. And then you got this other nation right next to it called Mauritius, which has a couple of islands. Uh, again, hard to get to widely spaced islands. So so basically, out of all that, the prospect that is most appealing and most realistic is Fiji. And Fiji is what I have my eye on right now and what I'm laser focused on. So as you can see, let's look at that map. 
the two main islands that's called Viti Levu and Vanua Levu. Those are big islands. Those are big chunky islands. So it's not like total island roulette. Those islands have, there's a lot of room to move around and uh, you can really kind of, you know, you can navigate, you can actually chase. Some of the smaller outer islands, no, but those two big islands, you can. The other thing is that you can enter Fiji. Fiji allows you to come in if you're vaccinated and there's not a quarantine uh, period. So that also makes it appealing. Other things that I like about it, you can get to it pretty easily from LA with a nonstop flight and it's actually not that far. So that's another reason I'm really looking at it. And of course, the most important thing is that Fiji gets a lot of cyclones. This is what the, these are all the cyclones, hurricane strength cyclones that have passed near or over Fiji since 1980. And you can see, wow, a lot of action. They got a lot of storms. And I would be remiss not to mention the most important one, the one that stands out, the cataclysmic benchmark. And I'm talking, of course, about the mighty cyclone Winston. Look at that monster going through Fiji. All right. This is uh this is the track of Winston. This is from uh this is from 2016. And look at this crazy track. So here's Fiji. Started up here east of Vanuatu as a depression. It moved south, strengthened, got very strong, curved east, weakened to a tropical storm, kept going east, then made a hairpin turn. It was almost like it was it was almost like it was stalking its prey. Look at the way it was sort of like looping around Fiji, trying to figure out how to attack. And then finally it moved west and boom, turned into a category five, blasted Fiji. Okay. And then fortunately it took another hairpin turn before hitting Vanuatu. Thank God, because Vanuatu the year before had been devastated by a cyclone Pam, another really bad one. And then it kind of just made this big loop and died in the Coral Sea. But look at that crazy, crazy track. And uh, here are the stats hit on February 20th, which is peak season in the Southern Hemisphere, came ashore in a northern province of Viti Levu, that main most populated island. But look at that landfall intensity, 155 knots or 180 miles an hour, category five. This is the strongest known cyclone landfall in the Southern Hemisphere. This is the king. This is the top, even when you compare it to all the big storms that Australia has gotten. So Winston is a very, very important storm. Here's a close-up uh, of the track going through the islands, and you can see it really raked some of these outer islands before it blasted into Viti Levu. And here's, I have some cool satellite porn to show you. This is, um, this is a loop showing the storm uh, approaching the islands and you can see it just passing over each of these little islands, just totally raking them. It was a category five by this point. Notice, and then it, and then it kind of scrapes under that island. And then look at it, look at the eye clear out and get all round and perfect. That was when it reached peak intensity and boom, crashes into BT Levu. And also notice how it just disintegrates immediately. Or not disintegrates, but it lost a lot of its structure, which is of course very common when a cyclone passes over a mountainous terrain. Here is the eye of the typhoon. There's a visible shot passing over one of those outer islands. Uh, I thought this was a really cool shot. And then this is a radar shot of it passing over Coro Islands. And you can see it had a very, had a beautiful radar, radar presentation, but this was, this was an epic, epic storm. So getting back to it, Fiji is my best hope for a meal before the summer in terms of like a chaser dude meal. Now I want to be clear, I'm not hoping for a cyclone in Fiji. All I'm saying is if I want to chase, that's my best bet. So if something is going to hit down there, you could bet that I am going to be down there to hunt it down. All right. Next, I want to talk about Kestrel Instruments. Uh, as you guys know, I am working with them. As I just mentioned, I'm working with them as a brand ambassador. I've been using Kestrel Instruments for like over a decade, way, way, way before I ever started working with them or having any kind of relationship. Uh, they're just like the perfect instruments for me and what I do. Now, folks, uh, my friends, uh, other chaser dudes, and also just folks on Twitter are always asking me, uh, you know, which... Uh, which Kestrel model is the best for me? What should I get? So I made a little little explainer, a quick video, which explains like the basic, uh, the important models or the, the top models are the ones that I think are best and also how you can put them all together. So here's a quick overview of the Kestrel products and the ones that I love and use the most. Hey, hey, Josh Morgan here, also known as Hurricane Man. You know, I have one mission, which is to hunt down the biggest, baddest storms on the planet and collect data inside them. It's tough work, but I love it. And my tools of choice are my Kestrel weather meters. This here is the top of the line model. This is the 5500 with link Bluetooth. 
For the past decade, I've taken my trusty fleet of Kestrels into the greatest hurricanes and typhoons at every corner of the globe. These compact devices do it all, measuring air pressure, wind speed, temperature, dew point, humidity, and everything else that matters. And it's really easy to log data just exactly how you want it, whether you want to store readings every two hours or every two seconds. Why is the Kestrel weather meter my instrument of choice? simple. First off, they're accurate, down to the millibar. Every device is rigorously tested before it leaves the factory. Second, they're crazy portable. I'm a man on the go. I can't be dragging around bulky equipment. These sleek gadgets slide right into my computer bag. Then there's the durability. Kestrels ain't delicate. These things are drop tested, dust proof, and waterproof. They get knocked around and they keep on ticking. I've had a couple of my Kestrels for over a decade. They've been in Cat 5 hurricanes, collapsing buildings, extreme flooding, you name it, and they're still working fine. And you know what? They're just a great value. When you consider all the things that a 5500 measures, how accurate it is, and how long it lasts, they're a steal. It's money well spent. But what's especially cool about your Kestrel weather meter is the free app that comes with it. It's called Link. It works on iPhones and Androids. It takes a second to install. Then you connect your Kestrel with your phone via Bluetooth. And once you do that, you're ready to go. If you own multiple Kestrels like I do, the app lets you monitor all your devices from one convenient dashboard. Tap any device on the dashboard to view that one's readings in real time. Oh, and you can customize this view so you're only seeing the stuff you're interested in. And check out that device's history if you want to see the trends. My favorite app feature? I can easily export the data in Excel format and send it to myself or others for deeper analysis later on. That's important to me after a big historic hurricane, when the data really matter. I'm thinking back to Category 5 Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, when my Kestrel measured an incredible 913 millibars in the eye. Like I said, the Kestrel 5500 tells you a lot, but maybe you don't need all that. Maybe you need just a few really important things, like temperature, humidity, and barometric pressure. If that's the case, I got just the thing for you. Check this out. This is Kestrel's Drop. Yep, it's called the Drop. It's a cool little data logger. Looks kind of mysterious, huh? Well, it isn't. It's actually really easy to use, trust me. You just pair it with your phone or tablet, and then you use the Link app to calibrate the device, check current conditions, or pull the data from it. This little thing runs for a long, long time on a single three volt battery. And it's tough as nails. Don't worry about dropping this thing or knocking it around. It's built to last. Now, folks who follow my work know that I hunt with a whole fleet of kestrels. I plant them at different places along a hurricane's path so I can get a multi-dimensional record of the storm. If you're like me and you wanna do that kind of thing, like you're real serious about recording historic weather events in a complete way, check this out. This is the Kestrel Weather Spotter Kit. Look at all the goodies it comes with. The Kestrel 5500, a Kestrel Drop 3, the kit comes with one drop, but you can't add an extra one like I did. A vein mount and an UltraPod mini tripod. The vein mount is sturdy and simple. It takes a second to assemble and slip your Kestrel 5500 into it. Once you do that, just attach it to the secured UltraPod mini tripod and your Kestrel is ready to record powerful winds from any direction. And all this stuff comes neatly packaged in this sweet little case, tough and ready for the road. Where can you get all these great tools? The best place is straight from the source, kestrelinstruments.com. You can get each item, the Kestrel 5500, the drop, and the other stuff separately. But hey, I recommend the complete spotter kit. It's the best value, and that way you have everything you need to record extreme weather and make a difference to science. And here's an added incentive. You get a nice discount if you type the code ICYCLONE50 as you check out. Like I said, Kestrel weather meters have been central to my field work for over a decade. I wouldn't be caught without them. You have questions? Just ask me on Twitter or contact Kestrel directly. All right, I hope that helped you out. Um, I am going to be uh, doing more videos and explainers about various Kestrel equipment, how to use them better, um, other stuff that they offer throughout the year. So yeah, just definitely ask me because these uh, th this equipment has really helped me, like I said, make a difference to science. You know, do something useful, not just not just be an adrenaline junkie, but get into these storms, measure them, and just you know create value. All right, so. Next, I want to talk about a big event that just happened, Super Typhoon Rai, or uh, called Odette by the Filipinos. So this was a Philippines typhoon, and the reason uh, there's two names, uh, Rai is the international name. All typhoons, like all hurricanes, have an international name, but the Philippines, they also give 
when a typhoon comes into their sort of area of responsibility, they give it their own name because they feel like Filipinos will respond more if the name is one that they recognize. So this one was called Odette to the Filipinos. And uh, this is the track of it. You could see, and this was again, just a few weeks ago, uh, but it had a classic track. It just formed way out in the Pacific, moved generally West. And uh, actually when it got to about here, I didn't think it was really going to become much of anything. And then boom, it got really strong. That red dot means it hit category five. And then it rammed into what's called the Visayas region and the Northern part of Mindanao uh, of the Philippines, just raked through all these islands, then got into the South China Sea, re-strengthened, got even stronger here than it was in the Philippine Sea, which is very unusual. Usually uh, stuff doesn't get that strong in the South China Sea. Fortunately made a big U-turn before it got to Vietnam, stayed offshore, and then it finally just died. Now this is this is one of the few storms, you know, the last two years I've been lucky in that um, I haven't, because of the pandemic, I haven't missed many storms, maybe just a few, but not too many, uh, because interestingly, uh, all of the activity has been focused around North America in the U.S. and Mexico, places I could get to. Rye is one of the typhoons that I definitely, definitely would have chased this one. I would have been there for it. So I'm kind of bummed about that. But, you know, it is what it is. But let's take a look at this one and what happened. Uh it hit on, it was in the middle of December. Now folks were like, wow, that's really weird. December, whoa, like that's crazy. Actually, it's not crazy at all. The, the, the cyclone season in the Western Pacific is not like our season. It's different. It goes longer. Basically, all year round is typhoon season. And the, the period where they get really strong storms goes well into December. It is not at all unusual for the Philippines to get category fours or even fives in December. So it's climatologically pretty normal. And what's interesting was the other thing, the last two years have been dead in the Western Pacific. Typhoon activity is way below normal, but uh, the season ended with a with a big finale. And I think what made this storm so destructive is like, look at this, look at all of the landfalls. I counted nine landfalls in the, in the uh, Philippines. These are all the islands that it hit. And notice that a few of them, Bohol Island, Cebu Island, and Negro Sound, these are islands with millions of people. So a lot of people were impacted by this thing. Now, what was the landfall intensity? It's hard to know. It peaked at category five, just barely got into category five. And then it, uh, then it seemed to kind of come down. It lost a little structure as it was um, approaching that first island. So it looks like it made landfall as a very strong category four. Let's take a look at uh, the, the track. You can see it more closely. You can see it here, the track through all of those islands. And let's go even closer. And here you can see the nine landfalls. One, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, no, sorry. One, two, three, four, five. That's a little island right there. Six seven, eight, and then there's another one off screen there, nine, nine landfalls, crazy. Uh, and, and here is what it looked like just before that first landfall. This is Shargao Island. This took the full force of this thing. And here it is about a couple, like hour or two later when the eye passed right over that town. There's some very dramatic video from Shargao Island, which you can find on YouTube. I'm not going to play it here on my channel just because of copyright things or intellectual property. I want to respect other people's intellectual property and not play their videos on my channel, but you could check it out for yourself. Just, you know, Google it. And there are some very dramatic videos from there. This one hit during the day. So there is footage. Here's a shot of it as it was going through the Visayas, those islands. It had lost some structure, but basically it went through all these islands as a category four. This here is Balhal Island right here. And there's a town there called Ube. And you can see the typhoon was going in that direction. And here's what that town looked like after the storm. The New York Times did a really dramatic photo essay on the storm. And this is downtown Ube. And you can see the combination of wind and storm surge just devastated this uh, this community. I mean, this is really serious stuff. And here's a, this is a, a shot from the Philippines uh, Coast Guard. And you can see this is from actually Surigao City, which is the northern part of Mindanao. They got the southern eye wall. And you can see some serious, serious damage there. I mean, look at how, you know, look at those trees uh, decrowned and stuff like that. That means they got some serious wind there. This was a, this was a very, very serious storm. And unfortunately, uh, it looks like it was, uh, it, it was, I'd say, probably one of the worst in the Philippines since Super Typhoon Haiyan. Maybe not as bad as Haiyan, but it was a serious storm. And uh, keeping with the Filipino theme, now we can go to the next segment of the show, which is... Forgot so Forgotten Chases. 
I get asked a lot about the big storms, Super Typhoon Haiyan, Hurricane Patricia in Mexico, Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico, Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas. Those are the ones I get asked about again and again, and that folks want me to present about when I'm in events. But I like to talk about some of the other chases that folks don't ask about, and that's what this segment is for. And today, like I said, I'm going to keep it in the Philippines because I love chasing in the Philippines, and there's a bunch of reasons why. Uh, First of all, the Philippines gets many intense typhoons. Uh, I mean, like a lot of intense typhoons. It is the world capital. Uh, this here, this map here, you can see these are all the Category 5 typhoons that passed near or over the Philippines since 2000. So yeah, the second reason I like to chase the Philippines is many intense typhoons. And in case I didn't mention, they get many intense typhoons. <laughs> Point being, you can't say it enough that the Philippines is the world's ground zero for intense typhoon action. And just to give you an idea, okay, in the United States, we have records, we have about 170 years of good, pretty accurate records. In 170 years, the mainland United States has gotten four category fives, four category fives in 170 years. If you had Puerto Rico, we got five, okay? These are all the Category 5s that the Philippines has had just since 2000, and I listed them out. Here we go. There's seven or eight, okay? Seven or eight just in the last not even 20 years. Seven or eight cat. So that means like basically they get a Category 5 typhoon impact every three or four years. So no other nation gets hit like that. Not Mexico, not Japan, not Taiwan, not Australia, nowhere gets this kind of action. The Philippines is absolutely the world's ground zero for crazy, crazy tropical cyclone activity. And by the way, I have Goni kind of um, sort of grayed out because it's not clear that it was that it made landfall at that intensity. It looks like that. It, it, I asked someone at the Joint Typhoon Warning Center, I said, do you consider that a landfall? And they wouldn't give me a firm yes or no about it. So I don't know if Goni counts, but either way, it's seven or eight. Point is, they get a lot of action. Okay, and there are other reasons. There are other cool reasons to chase in the Philippines. Another is that English is widely spoken. So Philippines is linguistically a very complex nation. There are many, many languages. In the northern part, they speak what's called Tagalog. In the central Visayas region, they've got a bunch of languages. The area that was devastated by Super Typhoon Haiyan, they talk a dialect called Wade Wade. There's just a lot of languages down there. But almost everyone in the Philippines speaks some English. It's 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 sort of the one of the unifying languages in the nation. So you can actually get around with English, which is unlike some other nations in East Asia. So that's like really helpful. And then also another thing is that the people are great. And I'm not just saying that, I really mean that they're open to outsiders. So you can kind of get there and work there and really kind of have a good experience. And I'm thinking back after Super Typhoon Haiyan, I went back months later to, to sort of research the landfall zone and what happened. And I went to all those little fishing villages that took a direct hit. And I went and interviewed people. And I was probably this first tall white guy that had walked into these towns in 10 years. And folks were really nice and open and ready to talk about their experiences. They weren't like, who is this weirdo? So that's kind of how the Filipinos are. They're pretty welcoming to outsiders. So so it's a, it's a place where I feel very comfortable comfortable going and chasing. It's great. That said, there are challenges to chasing in the Philippines. First one is distance. It is a long flight to get there. So when I want to chase the Philippines typhoon, the first thing is a 14-hour flight from LAX to Manila. So think about that. A long flight just before the chase even starts. And then you land and, you know, you're all like on the other side of the earth and just kind of, you know, your biological clock is whacked out and then you got to go hunt a storm. Now, this is why I stay in good shape and why I'm such a health fanatic, because this kind of chasing, this sort of globe trotting, is hard on the body and hard on the mind. And you got to be in shape for it. The other thing is once you get to the Philippines, navigating is very, very complicated, okay? And the, because the nation is geographically very complicated. Okay, so first off, there's this, uh, the northern, this big, big island in the north, this is called Luzon. So it has this big east coast here and a lot of category five typhoons go ramming into it. And it looks like, oh, that would be great to chase there uh, because, you know, it's just this big target. It's a contiguous landmass, no island roulette. Mm -mm, it is actually very hard to chase. This is not like the east coast of Florida or like the east coast of Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula where there's like a, a highway and towns. Uh -uh. This is this is mostly undeveloped. It's just kind of unspoiled nature. There's a couple of very remote villages uh, dotting this coastline that you can only get to by helicopter or uh, boat. So this is like, this is really tough 
it's very hard to like to access these towns when you have a big typhoon coming in. So I've chased some Philippines typhoons. There's a bunch of cities inland over this mountain ridge, and you can still get a strong impact in here, but it's hard to get an impact right on the coast on a lot of Luzon. So that's Luzon. Then you get to what's called the Visayas region, and this is the part that just got raked by Super Typhoon um, Rai. And what makes this complicated is it's it's a bunch of islands. Now I won't call it island roulette because they're not little specks. These are big islands, but still there's a lot of complication in figuring out, okay, which island to get to. And, you know, you have to get to it in time before the ferries or the planes shut down. It's just, it's complicated. And then this big Southern Island, this is called Mindanao. They generally don't get typhoons, although there are some big exceptions like Typhoon Bopa in, two, in 2012. They had a category five that hit down here in December of 2012. Very unusual. Uh, but Mindanao is usually uh, south of the typhoon activity. It's also got some, it's politically a little less stable. It's probably not the best place to go as a foreigner from what I've heard, but uh, yeah. So, so Philippines is, th that's like another challenge is that sort of navigation aspect to it. Okay. So that's the turf. Now let's talk about the forgotten chase. And this, here it is. This is, uh, this is right when I was in the eye of this storm and it is the name of it is Typhoon Kamori, uh, called by the, ty the the Filipinos called it Tisoy. This was another December typhoon. This was in 2019. Now, this was the year I chased Hurricane Dorian. Now, if you guys remember, I chased Dorian, and then I was trapped in the Bahamas for days living in my car in this destroyed island. And I, you know, I got back to the U.S. I lost like 10 pounds. I looked terrible. I had to rest up after that. But later that fall, I was ready to go chasing again. And uh, and the, the other chase I did that year was Kamori uh, in the Philippines. It was at 120 knot, 140 mile an hour category four. And it made a direct hit on a pretty big city called Legaspi City. The eye passed right over the city. And that's where I was. I have fond memories of this chase because it was the last one I did before the pandemic, before before all the international travel shut down. Here is, uh, here's Kamori's track, uh, just formed way, way out in the Pacific, basically basically just marched west into the Philippines. So many storms get, they're, they don't do anything and then they get into the Philippine Sea and then they go crazy. The Philippine Sea has some magical property. I don't know what it is, man. Everything that goes into the Philippine Sea just goes nutty. Here's a closer shot of it approaching the Visayas region. And that's where the star is where I was. So you can see that was pretty much a bullseye there, just like got right in the storm. And it was a it was a very successful chase. And there's the eye passing over Legaspi City, and that's where I was. So yeah, it was a good successful chase. And here is what it was like on the ground. Now, generally I I hate uh, nighttime chases because you can't see anything, but I was at a hotel right on the ocean front that uh that had a uh, they had a generator. So the electricity on the property, even outside stayed on. So you could see what's happening. What's very dramatic is we're right on the waterfront with onshore winds. And one of the cool things you see is the storm surge in the water just coming up. This The land and sea just become one. Uh, it was just a great, this hotel was a great vantage point to really watch this storm and observe it. And here we go. Check it out.
Yes, that was a very dramatic hurricane. It was just like the location was so perfect and it was one of the best uh, night shoots I ever did. You know, go on my YouTube channel and check the rest of it because you get um one thing that I didn't show in this video was once we got in the eye, it was calm, but that ocean was still going crazy and there were just huge waves crashing into the building. It was a really weird storm, really, really interesting and cool. Now, one strange thing about it were the data that I collected. So, so... Legaspi City, we went right through the eye of the hurricane, or sorry, the typhoon, and it was it was a solid category four. It was estimated to be 120 knots, 140 miles an hour, and it felt like a category four, but the lowest pressure I got was about 963 millibars, which is really kind of high for a category four, especially in the Western Pacific where pressures are generally lower. So uh, I'm not sure what was going on there, but that was the data were a little weird with that one. You know, it's just, it's hard to know what was going on with that. But uh, I do believe that my data were accurate because I had multiple instruments and they corroborated and I was basically right at sea level. So there were no kind of issues with, uh, you know, with the elevation or anything like that. And with that, we get to my favorite part of the show. Get over it. <laughs> Yes, get over it, where I get to be obnoxious and uh, just get sassy and talk about something, express an opinion that's not popular, and just uh, just do it without apology and uh, and just ignore the comments if I want to. All right, so I think, and I think this opinion is probably a little unpopular. I'm going to talk today about, I'm going to give a passionate defense of the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale. Now, if you're not a hurricane nerd, you're like, huh? Like, what is he talking about? Like, defending a an intensity scale? Like what kind of nerdiness is that? Well, it is very nerdy, but it is something that people in the hurricane community, this is a, this is something that people really argue about. There are folks that think we should get do away with the scale. And then there are folks like me, traditionalists who say no, and I'm going to defend my position and tell you why I'm right. And to just be quiet if you disagree. All right, so let's talk about it. So first of all, what is the Saffir Simpson hurricane wind scale? As most of you probably know, it's a scale that rates hurricanes from one to five based on the estimated maximum sustained wind speed. So a couple of important things to emphasize there. One is estimated. Uh, it, it's very rare that the actual true highest wind of a hurricane is measured. It's almost never measured on the ground because the, the strongest part of the hurricane almost never passes directly over a properly calibrated weather station. So it's usually estimated. Um, another important thing to emphasize is maximum. So if a hurricane's maximum wind is, let's say, 100 miles an hour, only a very small part of that storm has 100 mile an hour winds. Even if you go right through the eye wall in the eye, it's very unlikely that you will get the 100 mile an hour winds. You'll probably get 80 or 90 mile an hour winds. So maximum means the maximum winds anywhere in the storm. And the other thing I want to point out is sustained wind, meaning a one minute average wind. And I point that out because um, I'm going to talk in a little bit about the Australian intensity scale. And in, in, the, in Australia, they communicate with the, the public differently. In the United States, when they talk about the maximum winds in a hurricane, they're talking about the maximum sustained one minute wind. In Australia, when they communicate with the public, they talk about peak gusts. They don't talk about sustained. They talk about what are the peak gusts that you're likely to experience. So it's a totally different way of communicating. But here in the US, we use a maximum sustained one minute wind and not a 10 minute wind. All, all the rest of the world uses a 10 minute sustained wind. We use a one minute. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the history of the scale. So the scale was invented in 1971 by an engineer dude named Herbert Saffer. He developed the wind scale. He felt that there was some need, some simplified numerical scale that just um, indicated sort of destructive potential of a hurricane. And then a meteorologist named Robert Simpson, who at the time was the director of the National Hurricane Center, he added storm surge values and air pressure values to go with Saffer's wind speed values to make like a complete scale. Uh, and, and Robert Simpson is, of course, a very important person in hurricane history, not just because he was a director of the National Hurricane Center, but just a great meteorologist as well. In 1973, the scale was introduced to the general public. And then in the late 70s, it was popularized by the director of that time, Neil Frank, who's a very 
someone I'm proud to call a friend and who is a very charismatic, uh, very media savvy director of the National Hurricane Center. And he used this scale to communicate with the public. And that's when Americans started to use this five point scale. Okay, so here's the old scale. These are the old wind speeds and these are the pressure and storm surge values that were sort of assigned to it. And you can see, for example, category three storm had winds 111 to 130 miles an hour, and it would have a pressure between 945 and 964 millibars in the eye, and it would produce a storm surge of 9 to 12 feet. So all seemed cool. The scale seemed to be working, but from the 1980s onward, we started to notice weird things. We started to notice hurricanes that did not fit properly in this scale. So let's look at some examples. And these are just a few that I picked. But one is, for example, Hurricane Gloria in 1985. It hit Long Island, New York. I went through it. It was the second hurricane I ever went through. I was just a little teenager. Uh, it had category one winds, but the pressure was category three. It was 961 millibars, which is a, that was that counted on the Safford Simpson scale as category three, but the winds were only 75 knots. So Okay, that's kind of weird. And we started to realize that hurricanes in more northern latitudes, ones that are transitioning and becoming extra tropical, the, 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 the pressure wind relationship is different. They could have very low pressures, but those really strong winds are not totally mixing to the surface. So we started to realize, okay, the pressure in the winds, it's not, it, it's not as hard that relationship between those two things is not as hard coded as we thought. Okay, and then another example. Charlie of 2004 <clears throat> hit Florida as a category four, had category four winds, 130 knots, 150 miles an hour, almost category five. This thing was really intense, but it was a very small hurricane and it only produced a category or what would be considered a category two storm surge. It only produced a storm surge of seven feet, which is pretty wimpy. And it was only in a very small area. So it's like, okay, that's weird. This thing was a really intense category four, almost a five. And the storm surge was <laughs> garbage. I mean, it barely had a storm surge. Okay. And then one of the best examples was Katrina of 2005. It hit Louisiana and Mississippi with category three winds, but with a, I'm going to call it a category 10 storm surge because the storm surge in and around Bay St. Louis, my, my home in Mississippi, in and around Bay St. Louis and past Christiane in Mississippi, that storm surge was pushing 30 feet. That was way, way beyond, like that was way into category five, but this thing was an unraveling category three as it hit the coast. Okay. Another example was Ike of 2008 hit Texas as a category two or had category two winds. The storm surge was category five, according to the old scale. It was about 20 feet and that over 18 feet, that's category five. So, hmm, okay. So we started to notice that the scale seemed to have some limitations that the, the relationship between wind and pressure and storm surge was not fixed. It depended on a lot of things, it depended on the latitude of the hurricane, depended on the size of the hurricane. Bigger hurricanes have bigger storm surge. Uh, smaller ones have smaller more storm surges, depends on how fast the hurricane is moving because fast moving ones produce lower surges, all kinds of stuff. So starting in 2010, the Hurricane Center removed air pressure and storm surge values from the scale. They just decided, you know what, we're going to separate it. We're going to take it out. So it went back to being a wind scale. And then they also made some tiny adjustments to the wind speeds to fix rounding errors. So this is the old scale and boom, this is the new scale. They, they changed these values a little bit, these numbers, and then they got rid of the pressure and storm surge. And this is the modern scale that we now have. And they, they renamed it the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale to be clear that we're only talking about winds. And I also, here I put the kilometers per hour for folks who are watching from down under or other countries that use kilometers per hour. And this is the scale we now use. Now, I thought this was really interesting. One thing I want to, quick uh, side note I want to make, I got a lot of Australian followers, so I want to talk about the Australian scale versus the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale, because both the, the Saffir Simpson Hurricane Wind Scale, which I'm just going to call the U.S. scale, both the U.S. scale and the Australian scale are five-point scales, okay? And it, it it creates a lot of confusion because when Australians and Americans talk with each other about cyclones or hurricanes, they're using different scales. So it's like, the, so the words don't mean the same thing. And the Bureau of Meteorology in Australia made this really helpful chart to show the difference. So the big difference is Australians don't differentiate. They don't have like, like in, in, in the Northern hemisphere, like whether you're in East Asia or here, we have tropical storms and then we have hurricanes or in East Asia, it's tropical storms and then typhoons. Okay, in Australia, they don't make that distinction. They're just tropical cyclones. And there's a five point scale that covers everything from weak tropical storm, from what we call a weak tropical storm, all the way to like a, you know, a nuclear grade category five. So 
one scale, one five point scale fits all of that. So for example, their category one is what is, doesn't even go on our scale. It's what we would call like a weak tropical storm. And then the top of their category two is what we start to call a hurricane. And basically as you get higher in the scale, they, they, they start to overlap better, but still what we call a category three um, in the United States and Australia, that's usually a category four cyclone. And then you could see, of course, there's overlap at the end. Um, if, if we have a category five, uh, the Australians would call that a category five as well, but it doesn't go the other way, meaning the Australian category five threshold is lower. There are storms that the Australians would call a category five, but that don't qualify as category five for us. Our category five threshold is higher. Our five is like crazy, crazy level of uh, intensity. All right. So that's the relationship between them and us. Anywho, back to the argument. Okay. So because, um, because the scale does not always capture the destructive potential of a hurricane. Some folks are saying do away with it. Um, Ike being a good example, uh, Sandy in New Jersey, New York being another example, it was like a category one and actually wasn't even technically a hurricane when it hit, but look at all the devastation it did. And how could that have been a category one or not even a hurricane? So folks are saying, get rid of the scale, just, just get rid of it. Or we should have some kind of scale that factors in everything, including the size of the storm and the storm surge and blah, 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 and do it all to an equation that then has a new number. And that's the number we use and just making it really complicated. And I say, I think those are all terrible ideas. I think let's just stick with the Sanford Simpson hurricane wind scale that we have now. And here's my four reasons. First off, simplicity. The, a scale, one of the most important things about a scale like this is that it, it, it it's a it's easily used by the general public and the public can understand it without a whole tutorial. And if you just keep it focused on the wind speed, which generally corresponds to stronger wind does generally mean higher storm surge, generally does. Okay, there's some exceptions, but generally the two things kind of go up together. If we keep the scale simple and have it based on wind speed, it just, it helps other folks. It helps just the layperson understand things without making it complicated. Number two, there's the familiarity factor. The scale is embedded deep in American hurricane culture. Americans across the Gulf Coast and in Florida all know this scale. This is a scale we've all been using. We all grew up with it. Uh, and it served us pretty well. Again, there have been a couple exceptions. People are really pissed that Hurricane Katrina was a three, and they don't like that Ike was a two. But bottom line is the scale has generally generally described the destructive impact of hurricanes pretty well. Michael did the cataclysmic damage that you would expect of a category five in general, generally most category ones don't have a lot of impact. It generally works pretty well. And we're familiar with it. The third reason is because of the, the hurricanes impacts and, and how many people are impacted by each thing. So storm surge is potentially the most destructive part of a hurricane. Uh, and actually it causes the most hurricane deaths. That is true. Okay. But more people experience a hurricane winds. Okay, unless you're in Louisiana where half the state is a swamp, or if you're in like parts of Mississippi, unless you're in those areas, only people at the immediate coast really get the storm surge impact. But millions more people get inland wind impacts. So keeping a scale based on the wind speed to me seems to make a lot of sense. And to communicate about storm surge separately, I think makes the most sense because the wind is something that impacts the most people. And finally, and this is the most important one, and this is based on my ground experience, is what I call the fear factor. For me, the scale, the scale rating correlates very well with how violent and scary a hurricane feels on the ground. Okay. And, and, and I also notice that it correlates very well to how people react to it. After a hurricane, when I talk to residents, I notice that it's usually, it, it, if they went through a direct hit from something that was category three or higher, most normal people, not freaks like me, but normal people, most of them afterwards say, wow, that was really scary. I don't ever want to do that again. The next time a hurricane comes here, I'm, I'm going to go visit my sister in Cleveland. The, the scale has, it's, it's a very good predictor of how violent and scary the storm is. And, and I think therefore it has potency when people hear four and five, they really listen. You know, I heard one person saying, well, you know, we should have this new scale and Sandy would have been a five. Sandy up in New York and in, 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 uh, in New Jersey would have been a five because 
blah, blah, blah. I had a lot of storm surge, whatever. Okay, terrible idea in my opinion, because you start calling stuff like that a five, you start just throwing that around. Oh, this is a five, that's a five, you know, because this one had a lot of rain or this one had a big storm surge because it moved really slow. You take away the sort of sacred status of, of, of five, okay? And the problem with that is you want five and four to be sacred. You want people to be scared when they hear those numbers. You want them to know that something really crazy is coming when they hear four and five, okay? And if we start kind of assigning those terms more loose or those numbers more loosely and, you know, giving other hurricanes that status because, you know, they, they're, you know, they're really rainy or, you know, because they're hitting a populated area with a lot of property. I think it's a terrible idea. And then and then what's going to happen is people are not going to take it seriously when we have a real five. So I think, yeah, like like the scale works well and stick with it. And if you disagree, all I could say is you're wrong and uh, get over it. All right. So there we go. That's my uh, that's my that's my sort of sassy bit of uh, opinion for today. And, uh, you know, that's it for today. I actually. Yeah. OK. I kept the program shorter, like I promised, because I felt like, man, the last time I kept it really long and uh, didn't want to didn't want to keep people so long. So there we go. Um, now I'm open to taking questions. And actually, Lois asked a question earlier, which was a really good one. She asked, uh, how far in advance do I try to get to the Philippines? to chase a hurricane there or a typhoon. And it's a great question. I mean, generally I try to get there, you know, a couple of days in advance, you know, that's ideal because it takes a lot of time to figure out, um, you know, where to go. And a lot of times in the Philippine Sea, the, um, the, the sort of the, the, the typhoons that hit there are pretty well modeled. So they, so they actually like, you, you see them days in advance and you can get out there, which is a good thing. And if I get out there a little earlier, I have time to kind of sort of like, you know, just get a little rest maybe and just kind of acclimate a little bit. But unfortunately, a lot of my Philippines chases have been what I call sliding into home plate and actually Kamori, that one I just showed you, that was um, that was an example. That was like a really, that was one where I just kind of got there just in time. And it ended up being like a really, it really, it ended up being like a very good chase for that reason. Uh, you know, it was just, uh, it was, it, even though I was running late, I got there just in time. Okay, another question here um, is about when I think Australia is going to open up. Uh, it, it's a great question, and I it's hard to know. Australia has very strict rules. I've pretty much given up on this year. I don't I don't think that there's going to be any or or this season. I don't think there's going to be any chasing. I think it's going to be, I think it's going to be really hard to. Uh, I, I think it's going to be. I, I just think with the Omicron variant and everything, I think it's going to be almost impossible. I, I don't expect them to open up with quarantine free travel this year, maybe next year. But yeah, that's why I'm really focusing on, uh, on, I'm really focusing on Fiji. All right. Uh, T. Vold asks, what damage do you typically see in mobile homes corresponding to each hurricane category? So mobile homes, uh, basically mobile homes are, are not a good place to be in any hurricane, even in a category one, but generally you're advised if a hurricane is coming, even a category one, don't write it out in a mobile home. So I'm not sure what the exact expected damage is at each level, but basically category one wins. If you get a direct hit from a decent category one, uh, those winds could destroy a mobile home, you know, especially depending on, especially depending on how it's constructed. So, so general advice to folks is, don't write out any hurricanes in a mobile home. Always get into a more substantial structure. Uh, Marcy Tillman asks, am I going to back to stay at Hurricane House when I return to Bay St. Louis? Great question. So I'm actually not sure. That's a good question. And that brings up um, uh, uh, an exciting topic, which is that I'm looking for a permanent hurricane house in Bay St. Louis. You know, the, the, the cottage that I've been that I've named Hurricane House is actually I rent it, I, um, and I've been that's what I've been doing the last couple of years, and I will rent it again this year. But I actually am looking for a home that I can call my own in Bay St. Louis, or maybe past Christiane or Gulfport, kind of like the western side of the Mississippi coast, just because that's the part I know better. I am searching for a house, so uh, if anyone knows of 
if anyone knows of any uh, any nice houses that are on the market, like any nice two bedroom houses, please do, or two or three bedroom houses, please do let me know. Uh, Pam asked, did I did not, did I, she says, you did not chase Winston. No, I did not chase Cyclone Winston. I think that was, um, I think that was, it was in 2016. And at that point I, I had not yet chased in the Southern hemisphere. You know, when I started chasing, I, um, when I started chasing, I was only, I remember at first I was only going to chase in the United States. And then the United States had a couple of really dead hurricane seasons and I got frustrated. So I was like, all right, I'm going to chase in Mexico. So I started chasing in Mexico. And then I was like, all right, U S and Mexico, that's going to be it. And then the U S and Mexico had a couple of really dead seasons. And then that was when I started chasing in East Asia, when I started chasing typhoons, I wasn't, it was never my plan to do that, but it was like, I felt like I had to kind of expand my horizons to just have, you know, to just always have stuff to chase because, you know, as you guys have noticed, the, the, the busy zone seems to migrate. Like, so for example, you guys have probably noticed when the Atlantic is really busy, the Pacific's kind of quiet. And when the Atlantic is quiet, the Pacific is busy. It's kind of like this. So if the, if you chase all around the world, you're always, there's always going to be somewhere that's having a busy season. Last couple seasons have been very busy around North America, dead in East Asia. So, you know, fortunately, even though I've been stuck in North America, I had stuff to chase. Uh, not fortunate that we've had devastating hurricanes, but, you know, the pandemic timed with, you know, I've been stuck in North America at a time of heightened North American uh, cyclone activity. Uh, but then starting in 2017, anyway, sorry, I went off on a tangent. I started chasing in the Southern Hemisphere, went to Australia. So Fiji's next. Uh, I, I have yet to chase a storm in Fiji, but that's my that's my next sort of plan. Um Tebold wants to know um, what trees survive cat four and cat five is the best. Well, those, those tall skinny palms do those things, those tall, really tall, really skinny, really kind of ones that gently sway like this. Okay. Those storms um, or those trees, those things are designed, they're engineered by nature to survive violent tropical storms. And you'll see that those trees will do really well, even in hurricane Dorian, where, which had sustained winds of 160 knots, 185 miles an hour. Even in that one, a lot of the trees in, in that went through the direct hit of that storm survived pretty well. And I remember at the height of the storm, I remember like on the backside of the eye wall after the eye passed, you just watch those trees, winds like the category five winds and those trees are just like, they're just kind of going like this. They're just sort of going with the flow. They're just, they're designed. They're like, they're sort of aerodynamic and flexible and they're designed to withstand winds like that. Now they, they don't always, I remember after super typhoon Haiyan in the Philippines, a lot of those, those types of trees just got snapped off mid trunk. And that means you had a really serious cyclone when you see stuff like that. Okay. Reading more questions here. <clears throat> Okay, Eric, my my treasured chase partner, Eric is already planning for next year. Eric asks, La Nina is expected to wind down during next summer. And by the way, La Nina means usually means busy Atlantic, slow Pacific. That's generally what it means. La Nina is expected to wind down early next summer, considering a possible neutral oh, episode. He means neutral Enzo. Um, do we expect a mean hurricane season in the Atlantic and the Eastern Pacific? I think that it's a good question. And, um, you know, seasonal predictions are kind of like their own expertise. They're not mine. Uh, but based on what I know and what I've heard, I think that we're going to have a healthy season on both. I think it's going to be a busy North American season. I don't think it's going to be crazy on either side, but I think we're going to have some decent action. Sub so Floyd says, have you ever, do I ever drink a hurricane after a hurricane? No, you know, I'm kind of, I, my party days are behind me. I haven't actually drank a hurricane in a really long time. Uh, actually, I was just, I was in New Orleans a couple of times this summer and yeah, I didn't, although my mom was in town and I, I made her have a hurricane. Okay. Let me just look here. I'm just looking at, there's a lot of questions here. I'm trying to figure out which ones to get to. Um, Louis Avery wants to know, do I have any videos that I'm going to upload? Uh, it's a great question. I'm pretty much caught up with my videos. Like I got all my 2021 videos done, but there are a couple of old ones that I'm thinking of doing. One of them that I need to do is Typhoon Chevy. 
uh, in Japan. That was a really, really good typhoon or not good. Sorry, that's insensitive, but that was a really strong typhoon, surprisingly strong. And I do plan to make that video. And then I was thinking to do Hurricane Earl in Belize City back in 2016, was it? Um, that was a long time ago, but I was in downtown Belize City as the storm surge came up and the, the city went underwater. It was a category one, but it had a pretty dramatic impact. I keep meaning to make that video and I will soon. Uh, yeah, there's, a, there's probably a couple of others in my archives that I need to just go back and do. As you guys know, I am very, uh, you know, kind of, I'm not the quickest about getting my videos out. And that's because, you know, chasers all have their own style, their own way of, own way of telling stories. Me, I like to, I like to, after a chase, really go through the footage, find all the cool pieces, and really like look at the footage again and again, and find the nice pieces and then really edit it together and, you know, make it nice. Uh, and what that means is I tend to release the videos a little slower and, you know, to my detriment, because if I release them faster, they would get a lot more traffic because when you release a video, when a hurricane is still in the news, it gets a lot more, you know, people click on it more. But for me, it's more important, the tra more important to me than the traffic is putting out a video that I, I just think captures the experience. I want each of my videos to be a, a real sort of document about, about kind of what, you know, what that event was, you know, and that's like, and, and, and that really captures it. And that means really going through the footage, taking the time, you know, when you come back from, a, from when you come back from a chase, you've got hours and hours of footage and you want to, you know, boil it down to 10 or 15 minutes. And that's really hard. It's, you have to go through and like watch a lot of clips that look the same and be like, okay, I think this one's cooler than that one. And it's just, I hate doing it, but, uh, but you know, I, I like to feel good about the, uh, I, I like to feel good about the, um, about the sort of videos I'm producing. Okay, more questions here. Louis says, tell me about Hurricane Maria. So Maria in Puerto Rico was an, a, a, an incredible event. It was a high-end category four, uh, basically the, the second worst hurricane in Puerto Rican history. Uh, the one that edges out Maria was the 1928 um, San Felipe Segundo hurricane. That was actually category five. Maria was just a hair below it, uh, you know, but it was, uh, it was, Maria was actually the kind of hurricane that you would expect in Puerto Rico every 50 to 100 years. Hopefully it doesn't happen again for another 50 to 100 years because yeah, man, I was there and that was a, that was a devastating storm. And that was another one of those chases where the impacts were so severe that I was, I was stuck in Puerto Rico for days. I, I was like, I think I was stuck there almost a week, just uh, kind of living there. And I don't complain about that because, you know, that's, I've talked about this before as a chaser, dude, when you, when you hunt down categories, fours and fives on remote islands and uh, Puerto Rico is, I don't want to say it's a remote Island, but it's a, you know, it's a separate land mass and it's far from the mainland U S this is part of the game. You got to know that, yeah, you're going to, you're going to be, you know, you're going to be stuck. You know, you might be stuck places, you know, for a while, you know, you might, you might, uh, you know, you might, it might take a while to get home and that's part of it. And if you're not cool with that, all I could say is, you know, don't chase because, you know, that's, uh, or don't chase internationally because that's, that's a game that not everyone can handle. Um, Alan Schwartz asks, um, um, he wants to know the two conferences that I talked about at the beginning of the broadcast, the Nat National Chasers uh, Summit, uh, National Storm Chasers Summit, and also the National Tropical Weather Conference. He wanted to know if those are live and not online. They are live conferences, but I think both of them have streaming options. But I always think live is better. I always say, uh, you know, try to get to them. Hurricane Central wants to know which was worse, Laura or Ida. It's, it's a great question because, uh, you know, they were both officially the same intensity, 150 miles an hour as they hit Louisiana. I would say Laura impressed me more, but I, I really, I think I, I think I did a better job chasing Laura with Laura. I, I nailed it. I got right in the middle of the eye, exactly like I wanted to. Uh, that's what I wanted. I wanted to go right through the center of the eye. It was just boom. Perfect. Nailed it. Uh, I, I kind of, I, I just, it wasn't a great chase. I got in the inner eye wall, so I didn't, it wasn't like a bust. It was a successful chase, but I didn't get in the eye. But by the time the storm made a weird turn right as it was approaching me. So I, I didn't go all the way through the eye wall into the eye. And that just really annoyed me. Um, and I, so I think that Laura, I probably, I feel like I got a better piece of it. So Laura felt stronger to me, but they're both clearly, you know, epic storms. I mean, Louisiana is going to look back at the, the early 2020s. It's like, wow, just a really like a, like a bad time, you know, a time when they really got, you know, 
when they really just got nailed, you know, repeatedly. And also, you know, it's just, it's going to take a while for them to recover. Uh, Louis wants to know if I have a, a typhoon, a, a video of Typhoon Haima. Haima was a category four that hit the Philippines. Um, the device that I recorded most of the footage on with that, before I took it, the, the footage off that device, the device died. And I brought the device to several sort of doctors who like, you know, know how to get data off of a, a dead device and they couldn't get this stuff off. So it looks like most of my high ma footage was just lost. And it was, you know, it's kind of heartbroken. I sort of, it was a long time ago. I processed it. It was a bummer because uh, that was a really, that was a, that was a pretty intense typhoon. It was another, it was another, uh, you know, kind of uh, nighttime storm though. So that really kind of limited what I could, um, you know, what I could, sort of shoot. Someone's asking me, have I ever been mugged while chasing a storm out of the country? No, I have not. I've had good luck. I've had really good experiences wherever I've chased. Um, that's something that, uh, that's something I've just, I've always had wonderful luck in that way. Just uh, people have always been good to me. Um, do countries outside of the U.S. have devoted hurricane chasers? Um, it's a great question. So storm chasing is a very, it's a very American thing, I would say. I, I feel like it's it's it's. I don't want to say it's an American invention, but I, obviously it's it's in the U.S. If you say you're a storm chaser, people know what you mean. If you know, in Europe, I lived in Europe for a long time, most of my 30s, and uh, you know, I remember in Europe, you know, I talk about storm chasing, and people just you know, in in Berlin and Prague are just like, huh? Like <laughs> there's not as much storm chasing culture in Europe and in other countries. And I noticed like when I'm chasing in East Asia, when I'm chasing in Japan or Taiwan or like Philippines, I, I never run into other chasers. It just, it's, it doesn't seem like it's common outside of the U S there are some, I know some European chasers, but also the poor Europeans, they don't have anything really to chase there in terms of, I mean, parts of Europe do get destructive tornadoes, but if you really want to get the big action, you have to come to the U S and of course the Europe doesn't get hurricanes. So, that Europeans have to travel or live elsewhere. Now, um, there's James Reynolds, my very, like one of my very best friends. He's British. Uh, he lives in Japan, in Tokyo. So he's in a good position to chase typhoons there. But, you know, he's basically the only guy in East Asia that I know who chases a lot. Now, another country that I think has a big storm chasing culture is Australia. Australia is the closest, in my opinion, to the United States, where I know a lot of Australian chaser dudes. There just seem to be a lot down there. And I feel like they have their own culture, you know, and I'm good friends with the, um, you know, the Oz cyclone chasers, you know, they and I are very good friends and those guys are dedicated, you know, tropical cyclone dudes. And there are other ones down there as well. So Australia, I would say is the closest, but I, you know, storm chasing is still kind of, I would say it's very much, a, it, it's still a phenomenon that exists in the kind of Anglo American world, I would say. Just looking at questions here. What was my longest chase? Actually, Council Member nine, uh, 11 wants to know. So my longest chase was um, actually, I think, Hurricane Grace uh, this this past summer with uh, with my good buddy, Eric. You know, we chased it on the Yucatan. Then we flew to Veracruz and chased it there. So the chase lasted several days. It was a real kind of marathon chase. I would say maybe that was one of my longest. Uh, in terms of which place I've been stuck in the longest after a storm, I would say maybe it's a tie between actually probably Maria and Puerto Rico. I felt like I was there almost a week and then probably Dorian in the Bahamas, then maybe Haiyan in the Philippines. Those were all cataclysmic impacts where I was really just needed to kind of like, um, you know, just kind of, you know, wait out those experiences. Hurricane Central wants to know, have I ever been injured on a chase? Not seriously, but yeah, I've had, I've had scratches, bruises, cuts. I stepped on a nail that went into my foot. I, I, um, during Patricia, when when uh, Eric and I were in a hotel that was just blowing apart, we were forcing a mattress up into the ceiling of the bathroom to to protect us and the and the six other people, including two children that were inside this little bathroom with us. And I had my adrenaline was pumping so big time that I just I, I don't know what I did. I felt fine at the time because I had so much adrenaline, but afterward, like my arm, like I did something to it, uh, you know, just uh, you know. So so like I've had stuff like that happen, but I've been lucky. Now, in Super Typhoon Haiyan, I was with James Reynolds and also our friend Mark Thomas. Mark and I jumped in the water into the storm surge to rescue people at the height of the storm because our hotel was going underwater. We both just jumped in the water and started like swimming over to the windows to pull people out. Poor Mark 
something happened where his leg hit some wreckage under the water. He got a big nasty cut and get this, it got so infected that by the time he got back to Taiwan, like two days later, it was so infected that he was about a day from amputation. If he had gotten home a day later, they would have had to have removed his leg. That's how infected it was. And he had to go through a bunch of painful surgeries to fix his leg. And thank God they fixed it. You know, Taiwan has an incredible healthcare system, one of the best in the world, and they were able to save his leg. But uh, that's the kind of stuff that, that you know, when that happened to Mark, it made it, it made it all real to me. And I realized, wow, that could have been me because I had shorts on and I was just, in, I was in that dirty water too, you know, just trying to save people. Wasn't thinking about the wreckage underneath the water, you know, and uh, just thank God Mark still has his leg. And <laughs> thank God that I'm still here after all these years, you know, still chasing storms. Uh, so let me see what other questions here. Lois, yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to rub in that you guys don't have weather. I mean, I know you do. England, I mean, I mean, the United Kingdom, you guys do have weather. And there was the great, you guys call it a hurricane of 1987, I think it was. It actually was not a hurricane, what happened there in England. Uh, and, and everyone, every Brit I know who's, you know, over the age of 40 remembers it. Um, but that was a serious, serious storm it had hurricane force winds but it was not a hurricane because it was not a, it was a the storm was not of tropical origins but it was it was serious i think the winds in it were equivalent to maybe what you'd get in a category 1 hurricane so it was a you know it was like it was like a very very serious uh event all right I'm trying to see any other questions here that i want to get okay Juan Pedro Mariano wants to know, which of the future chase turfs do you think is the most logistically challenging? That's a great question, Juan, because I think about this all the time. Uh, you know, like I try to imagine places I haven't chased. I think I, I want to chase in Madagascar at some point, and I think that's going to be complicated. <laughs> like I imagine that's going to be very complicated because when I look at maps in Madagascar, you know, on the East Coast, there's towns, but then there's like no roads connecting them. So that's going to make it really hard. It actually, Madagascar reminds me of Nicaragua. I haven't, you know, I didn't chase uh, Eta or Iota down in Nicaragua. The main reason being, uh, it doesn't look chaseable to me. There's no, there's a couple of tiny towns on the East Coast, but there's no roads connecting them. So you can't really chase. You got to just kind of pick a town. It's almost like island roulette. And I like to chase. I like to refine my position to the very end. And you kind of can't do that with, with some of these uh, with some of these places. So I would say Madagascar is going to be pretty, pretty challenging. And then parts of Australia, man, are tough. Like Western Australia, you know, Western Australia gets great storms. And you have towns like Karatha and Port Hedland. Uh, but in between those towns, you could have 100 miles of nothing. So that could be co complicated too. But at least there you have roads. That's the one thing. Uh, okay, Richard. Um, it's got so many good questions here. Hurricane Central says, any tips for me when I start storm chasing, Josh? He says, I want to follow in your footsteps and be a storm chaser. Thank you very much. I'm honored. Uh, I, I always worry. I, I want to inspire people. And it makes me excited that I inspire people to chase, but I'm always worried that someone's going to do what I do and then get hurt. So I want to be really clear, really put safety first. I, I mean that, you know, I've been doing this 30 years around the world. Yeah. This is my, this is literally my 30th. This is my 30th year chasing. I started really young and, uh, you know, I'm still here because I'm a daredevil. I go for it. I take risks, but at a certain point I, I, you know, in a category five, I don't go out driving while I'm in the eye wall, stuff like that. I try to, you know, and, and listen, I, I know some guys who are out in their cars during hurricane Michael during a category five. I, I have a rule that I do not comment on other people's chasing. I don't, I don't, um, it's just, I won't do that because I remember when I was 21 and I was chasing, I remember, you know, veteran, you know, like older veteran chasers, like, you know, like scolding me for not being safe. And I was just like, yeah, whatever. So I promised myself when I became, a, you know, a seasoned veteran that I would not be, I would not be that like, you know, finger wagging, you know, dude. So I'm not going to do that. But I would say like me, I would, I would not be in a, like in a car in a category five, I'd be in a building, stuff like that. Always, always, always make sure that you're above this, the um, where the storm surge is going to come. That's like, I mean, that's rule number one. You know, that's what makes chasing Louisiana so hard because so much of Louisiana is just like, 
it's so flat and so low that you could be 20 miles inland and you're not safe from the storm surge. It makes it really hard to chase. Like Louisiana, I always say it, I love Louisiana. It is a cool state. I hate chasing air. I just hate it. I hate it. As much as I love you, I'm sorry. You know, I'm Louisiana. Again, it's one of my favorite states, but like ugh, chasing, it's a chore because it's hard to chase safe there. You know, that's one of the things that's really kind of like a, a challenge. Okay, Lois asks, you mentioned earlier that you may position in the Southern Hemisphere if it was going to be busy down there. So would you consider renting somewhere similar to Bay St. Louis? That's a great question. And yes, I do think maybe after the pandemic passes or after whatever, after the worst part of the pandemic passes and there's like international travel again, I have thought about that. The one, the one benefit of the pandemic, and I'm a glass half full kind of guy, I try to look at the bright side of, of every situation in life. And the one cool thing about the pandemic is that it's uh, it's made it so you, it, it doesn't matter where you are physically. If you have business obligations or whatever, it doesn't matter if you can meet in person or if you're on the other side of the world and you meet via Zoom. So it means it gives you all this freedom that you didn't have. So I have been considering that maybe, maybe one December, I'll just go down to Australia and live there for three months, you know, so I could chase cyclones down there. If I did that, I would definitely set up in Queensland. The reason being uh, that Western Australia is a little more prone to cyclones and to intense cyclones, but it's chasing there is hard for a couple of reasons. One is that the towns are really, really, really far apart. And the other thing is that they got really strict rules there. Australia, the Western, Western Australia, that state in Australia has some of the strictest rules on the planet about what you can do during a cyclone. Okay. Like probably the, the, the loosest places on the planet are like Taiwan and, and Japan. They like, no one ever asks you what you're doing during a typhoon. A policeman never pulls you over and says, why are you out? They just like, I don't know what it is. They just don't care. Philippines is kind of like that too. Uh, it, the U.S. is probably in the middle. It depends what state. The U.S., you can kind of do what you want, but cops, if you're in a dangerous area, they'll ask you what you're doing. Okay, Western Australia, they have some serious rules. Once they go into red alert, you get a major fine, like thousands of dollars if you are caught out on the roads. So <laughs> that makes chasing kind of hard in Western Australia. Uh, Queensland does not have those rules. So I'm thinking maybe Queensland. And there's also the Northern Territory and Northern Territory is where Darwin is. Uh, Darwin, which got flattened literally by a cyclone in 1974, uh, Cyclone Tracy. Uh, problem is most of the Northern Territory is not chaseable. It's, uh, it's either remote swamps, kind of like Louisiana, or it's Aboriginal towns that you can't just, you can't just barge into them. You need a, you need a permit to do that. And so that makes it complicated. So Northern Territory is kind of topographically and culturally complicated. So Queensland is probably where I would base. Uh, but I have thought about, as you could tell, I've done a lot of thinking about this. Okay, lots of good questions here. Uh, Council member 11 wants to know, have I ever gotten in trouble with the police while chasing? No, not really. Um, I One important thing when you're chasing is you 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 don't want to be a burden on the locals. And when a, when a place is having a hurricane emergency, they're, they're cops, they're firefighters, they're paramedics. All those people are working overtime to try to, you know, keep order during an emergency. And so you don't want to be this idiot from out of town who's creating problems and not doing as they ask. So it's really important to not create problems and, and to not do things that would get you in trouble. Um, you know, that said, I am, I am covering the storm for media. You know, I work, I'm a, right now I'm a field correspondent for Weather Nation, which is amazing. I love working with Weather Nation. They're really cool. They let me be the chaser dude that I want to be. And because of that, I have a press credential and that gives me access. You know, when, you know, when you show that to the police, they understand, okay, I'm a journalist. I'm here covering the storm. So that's, that's very helpful, you know, but one thing I'll say is, you know, with the cops, you know, don't disobey them, have a conversation if you want to, but at the end of the day, don't take too much of their time. They are busy if there's a hurricane coming. Okay, more, so many questions here, and I'm trying to I want to make sure I get to at least a lot of them. <laughs> Sub Floyd wants to know: Do people in LA know how to drive in the rain? Well, <laughs> it's a good question. Um, we only in Los Angeles, <clears throat> it only rains part of the year. We basically there's a three or four month period. It's actually right now that's the rainy season. Otherwise, we don't get rain. So what happens is we go eight or nine, maybe ten months with absolutely no rain. When we get the first rain in December or January, because you have oil buildup from for ten from ten months 
of no rain. The roads are crazy slippery. It's not like in Mississippi where it's just, it rains hard every week and the roads are constantly getting cleaned. That's not how it is here. You have 10 months of oil buildup and then you get a rain and things are really slippery. So it's not just that Angelinos can't drive. It's that it, it gets really slippery here. After a lot of rains, the roads get more normal. But I would say in general, Angelinos in Southern California is no, they're not terribly comfortable driving in the rain. You know, it's just, it's not part of our culture. <laughs> So many questions. Uh, let me see. Council member 11 wants to know, have you ever had to retrieve from chasing a hurricane? Not sure what you mean by that. Do you mean have, have I needed, have I, did someone need to rescue me? Uh, no, no, I've never needed to be rescued. I've rescued other people, but, um, but yeah, I've never, uh, I've never, actually personally been rescued, fortunately. All right, let's see. Any other questions before I wrap this up? Okay. Maria Gross wants to know, how do you find a safe place to stay during the strongest winds during the chase? What is the process considerations when finding them, like hotels and buildings? Yeah, it's a great question. So it depends. Um, there's a lot of factors. One is the intensity of the hurricane. Um, if it's a Category 5 or 4, I'll treat it differently than a Category 1. In a Category 1, I'll be a little more um, like less concerned about the quality of the structure I'm in. In a 5 or a 4, I really do think about the quality of the structure. And in fact, in, in Hurricane Dorian in the Bahamas, which was a, you know, a nuclear grade category five, that one I relocated the last minute because the, 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 I was in a condo and it just, I was knocking on the walls and I could hear it was hollow. And I was like, all right, these walls are not going to stay up at that point. It was a category four, but I was like, these walls are not going to withstand those winds. And thank God I did move because that condo complex got obliterated in the storm. Uh, Cause you know, it got so strong, but generally, um, you know, keep in mind, I'm, you know, safety is unfortunately is it's, it's not for normal resident. It's all about safety. It's just about getting through the storm in one piece. So I would say if you're going through a strong hurricane, uh, I always say, get into an interior room, get as, you know, get, get into a room. It could be a bathroom or a closet that, that does not have any exterior walls, get as many walls between you and the outside as possible. That Do that, stay away from windows and doors and you'll survive almost anything, even a category five. Even if your house gets blown down, usually the interior rooms will kind of stay up. So that's what I always tell people. Now, I don't do that because I'm there to document the storm. I wanna see it, I wanna film it. So then it becomes, all right, how do I do that in a safe way? And uh, if I'm trying to watch the storm and it's a really intense one, what I try to do is whatever structure I'm in, I try to get on the downwind side. Uh, a good example was Hurricane Zeta in Mississippi. I rode it out in Hurricane House and I was a category two, but that was a category two with a bite. And at the height of the storm, at the absolute height of the storm, I could stand on my porch and just watch it because the wind was blowing in perfectly it was the wind was blowing in in a direction where it was coming from behind the house and going forward so i could literally just stand on the porch without even getting wet and watch watch it really rip so a lot of it is about sort of like your angle now that said in really intense hurricanes especially when you get into the inner core you'll have meso vortices and all kinds of crazy things so the the direction of the wind becomes very unpredictable so you're really when you get into intense hurricane eye walls you're really never totally safe. Uh, and that's something that, um, that, that you have to really be mindful of that, that the, the wind dynamics in the inner cores of very intense hurricanes are pretty wild and unpredictable. Mavic Cab Cabillos or Cabillos says, if it wasn't for the pandemic, at what point, um, at what point would I have, uh, would I have been on Shargao Island to catch rye? So Shargao Island is where rye Super Typhoon Rye came ashore. Honestly, I'm going to be really honest. I don't know if I would have, I don't know if I would have been on Shargao Island. I mean, I don't know if I would have realized early enough that that was the best place to be. You know, I, uh, it, 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 there's a good chance I would have ridden it out maybe in Surigao City, which is an extreme north of Mindanao, or maybe in Southern Leyte, because then you have a nice contiguous landmass. It's not just a little island. I don't know if I would have been on Shargao Island. Now, if I had a crystal ball, yeah, oh yeah, Shergao Island, absolutely. That that was like the perfect, that was the perfect spot to kind of ride out that storm. Absolutely. Uh, 
Uh, council member 11 has a lot of good questions. Have you ever had any problems finding the right building to stay in? Oh, absolutely. That's always a problem, especially with an intense hurricane. And I think the best example of that was Patricia. I was with my good friend, Eric, and, uh, it was coming ashore as a category five. And we ended up in this tiny town. That's where it was coming ashore. And we couldn't really find a very solid building. And we just, we checked into a hotel that, you know, had a wood roof, we knew it was probably not going to survive the storm, but it was the best we could find. You know, sometimes you just have to make do with what you have. Jonathan Carbo wants to know, is there any type of storm location or intensity wise that would scare you? Um, yeah, I've been in, I've been in situations where I felt, um, uh, where I felt unsafe. I mean, actually the best example was Dorian. The, the night before Dorian hit, before it was even a category five, it was approaching the Bahamas as a very strong four. And I was in a condo complex right on the water. And I was like, all right, the water will come up. I'll just ride it out of the second floor. It'll be okay. And then, you know, the storm started really bombing out. The, the recon flight was starting to, they were starting to find category five winds. I was starting to, and the wind was making this weird howling sound. And I, I got spooked. I was like, I just felt like I was going to die there. <laughs> like, I got like, you know, I can talk about it. You know, I'm, I'm man enough to admit when I get scared, I just got spooked. I just felt like, all right, I'm going to die here if I stay. And I bailed and I left and I went, I drove back into the main town, Marsh Harbor and, uh, and, and rode out the hurricane in a big school, a shelter on a hill in town. Now that's generally not where I want to ride out a storm in a shelter because a shelter has rules, you know, and there's like, there's like police dudes telling you what you can do and stuff. But that was one where it was serious enough that I was like, you know what? <laughs> this is the best compromise. Like, I, no, I don't want to ride it out in a shelter, but I also don't want to die in like a category nine. So, uh, you know, and I think it was the right choice when I saw the damage that happened, you know, in that hurricane, I think I did the right thing. But uh, Dorian was one that, yeah, that scared me a little, you know, and that's the nature of this. It's the nature of this uh, lifestyle is that, you know, you get scared sometimes, you know, it's uh, that's part of it. You know, that's what makes it meaningful. I mean, you don't, you know, hurricanes, uh, hurricanes are, uh, you know, uh, the, the thrill of it is that you never know what's going to happen. All right. A lot of good questions. I want to thank you all for joining. I think this was really fun. And yeah, this is a lot shorter than previous episodes. This is just an hour and a half. Okay. Uh, well, longer than I expected, but still shorter. Uh, I want to thank all of you. This was a great fun to uh, be with you like this. I hope to see some of you at the National Storm Chaser Summit next week in Oklahoma, Oklahoma City. Please come. If you have questions about it, ask me. And uh, yeah, uh, thank you again for joining me. And oh yeah, just in case, I just want to make sure you guys, ones that don't follow me on social media, there are my handles. Uh, it's iCyclone on Twitter, iCyclone on Facebook, and on Instagram, it's iCyclone1. All right, that concludes episode four of iCyclone Live. Thanks and be well.